It was a gardening season for the record books. Growers saw results both above and below their expectations, with a lot of surprises thrown in. We will visit the gardens of 2012, see their yield, and learn a lot from the people who grew them. Plus, we have answers and analysis from the experts and a look ahead to the garden season of 2013. All straight ahead on this special one-hour fall harvest edition of Great Gardening. If you look, you actually see the growth for next year. This is a plant that's been infected with early blight. I can feed a lot of people. I always want to use a garden fork. You just wrap it. Take a look at the environment, try to work with your environment. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish. It's time for the fall harvest and with us to review this most interesting garden season are our two specialists, Tom Casper, the president of the Duluth Garden Flower Society, and Bob Olin, horticulturist and county educator and gentleman. Thanks as always for being here. I know that they are all unique, but have you ever seen anything like this past growing season? You know, I, I really don't think that we have. It was really, really unusual, starting out being very, very warm in March even. That's right. And then, of course, we did set some records and uh, gave us some record results, but also mm -hmm. brought some rather interesting uh, challenges, let's put it that way. For sure. We're yeah. Gonna... yeah, it really was kind of a crazy year with all the rain, of course, the big right. flood that we had, and then the record heat in July and, and no moisture, really significant beyond that heavy rain that we had, so challenges with moisture and water and keeping our our plants healthy so results have been interesting and we do have a, a lot to review we'll talk about growing great sweet corn preserving the harvest and much more but first we want to welcome our esteemed phone volunteers who are standing by to answer your pressing garden questions they are the st louis county master gardeners we thank them for being here please give them a call at the number shown on your screen locally 218-788-2844 our call toll free 1-877-307-8762 and uh, we'll get to those questions throughout the hour. What a great picture of them. That was a nice picture, wasn't <laughs> it? <laughs> well, earlier this month we visited the gardens at Glensheen. Produce was ready for the picking and Bob was there to give us a little overview. So much of garden production, whether it's fruits and vegetables or whether it's ornamentals, is really in response to the type of weather conditions that we have. And of course this year we started out with warm conditions in May, warm conditions back to March. And then uh, we had of course the real heavy rain in some areas, 10, 11, 12 inches, the flood that occurred right here in Duluth, followed up by an extremely dry period, hot and dry. So we saw the expression of uh, a number of different insect populations that we hadn't seen in the past, included the variegated cutworm, as well as a lot of leaf hopper and as well as cucumber beetles which we haven't typically seen in the past but it also resulted in warm season crops uh, really proliferating during the year as long as you had water for them particularly in the month of july which was the hottest on record we needed water to go with that but that did result in tremendous yields of some of our warm season crops tomatoes uh, sweet corn if there was water uh, many of the peppers are doing extremely well well, that's some of what was happening in the vegetable gardens in Tom, the city parks and gardens, and including the Rose Garden, really flourished. But there were some challenges with our annuals and perennial flowers as sure. well. Sure, yeah, you know, anybody that was growing stuff in containers with, with again, that heat that we had in, in July and August, and even at the beginning of September, really had to find ways to ensure that they were getting water to those. And then if they were, plants were flourishing and growing so rapidly that folks needed to fertilize them. And, and do that on a regular basis to keep them healthy as well. So. You know, Tom, we're all fond of container growing, but this year was an example where they, they tended to burn out. The growth was so intense, so yep. fast, that people got yields early, but not the type of yields you could have had if you had the option of getting it in the ground. That's right. All right. Well, for some, growing gardens is part of the lifeblood of their community. We visited Brule River Farms in northwest Wisconsin for a look at how gardening setbacks present new opportunity. I'm Sue Ann Dumke, and this is Brill River Farm. I'm Dave Dumke, and I'm her staff. <laughs> I'm the president, yeah. And we're about uh, six miles north of Brule, and we're 
on clay. So there is no drainage down. Everything is surface drainage and we have to work with that. We've built soil on top of the clay and that's really what you have to do when you're in red clay. Um, we do sand and then compost or composted manure and mix it and basically try to build as much up on top of the clay as we can. We started out really small with one little garden and then became addicted to growing things and had to find markets for them. So Sue Ann and I uh, started the uh, farmers markets in Superior and organized it and kind of put it together and found that there was a big market for fresh, uh, really good food. Then we uh, got into high tunnels, and that gives us three weeks early and three weeks late. So we can plant string beans in March and have them ready for the market in June. And so we should have beans all the way through the full market season, you know, from June through October. This whole section of, ca of cabbage, this is the second planting. The cabbage actually pulled through the rain pretty well, but it got just hammered by cutworms. You know, they were probably around for about eight weeks. Yeah. As we're trying to train people to eat kale instead of lettuce, because lettuce is actually, you hit certain times of the year where it's difficult to grow. Um, kale, broccoli, anything that during the heat of the summer seems a little bitter, if you just cook it your, or blanch it for about three minutes, it sweetens up. It's been a good year for peppers. Yeah. So yeah. these little yellow or orange ones are called yummy. That's as big as they get. And then they turn orange when they're ripe. Those are sweet, delicious little peppers. And then the next uh, section is an orange pepper that's a little bit bigger. And that one's called orange blaze. And then there's a purple pepper that's kind of one of our standard peppers that people don't see very often. They're not a real strong green pepper flavor either. They're um, a little spicier and interesting, you know, having a purple pepper is just more interesting. The chickens actually take care of a lot of the leftover zucchini, the tomatoes that have, you know, are bad, um, anything that we don't use ourselves. This is um, melons, so watermelons, musk melons, um, but also the birds were pecking the melons and so um, David hung a bird ball up there. And one of the best varieties um, that we really like is called sorbet swirl. Again, in this northern climate, we're looking for fast maturing varieties. And so sorbet swirl, sweet favorite, sugar babies, which are the old time favorite, um, those are some of the main melons that we grow for watermelon. You know, we just have felt that that's the way to grow is without putting a bunch of chemicals on the food that we're going to eat. So it's, it's a commitment for us. That was a fun place to visit and uh, a lot of replanting this year. Bob, uh, you've promoted uh, replanting to sustain well, the we, crops all season. We use a succession plan right. so that we get a continuous growth. And this year we, we did a little bit of succession planting early after we washed out. So. Uh, we kind of share the pain of the good folks there at Brewer Farm mm -hmm. where you had to come back for one reason or another and uh, and plant a second time. You just never, ever, ever want to give up with this game, do you, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you um, want to, um, want to, a few of the results of not giving up are, are shown right here, too. Uh, you had some beautiful growth in some of the later season crops. Well, you mentioned even the beets that we have mm -hmm. right here. Uh, this is the third planting because we had, uh, oh. where these are grown, we had two inches of rain followed by the ten and a half inch rain and washed out the beet planting both times. So I had to come in a third time, but there was still enough time to get a... Oh my goodness, Tom. We're going to take a look at some of those beets, though, and how they look when, when they're cut open, because we were lucky enough to see you show us those. And there are, are four different varieties that we got to look at. Um, there were the classic red beet, uh, the golden beet, the albino, and the candy stripe. And just uh, tell us a little bit about each of those. Sure, since it is the year of the beet or designated by the Duluth Community Garden folks, um, they're more than just classic red beets uh, and they have a great deal of interest. We're kind of introducing people to this wide variety of uh, beets. Uh, the Goldens as well as the Candy Stripes are known as Shiojas. The Albino Whites, uh, they're all very interesting. They all have beet-like flavors. I think the Goldens have a very mild flavor. Uh, I've got to work a little bit on germinating some of the seed here and you have to be very careful about uh, moisture levels with some of them, but uh, we have both 
heirlooms as well as uh, many of the new hybrids. And uh, we certainly, they're a northern crop. We can do a great job growing beets. And uh, they're actually delicious. Uh, the year of the beet. It is the year of the beet. Uh, we make sugar out of some of them, some varieties, of course. So uh, I have to admit or confess, uh -huh. I tried beets for the first time in my life the first this time. year. Growing them or eating them or both? Um, <laughs> eating them. I did not grow them, and I even liked it a little Good bit. For you. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. All right. And, uh, okay, so we want to talk a little bit about this. It's uh, well, ginormous. This yeah, this is, it's kind of interesting because we talked about the growing season and so many varieties really lived up to their genetic potential. Uh, this is a, uh, an heirloom squash. People sometimes will call it a Cinderella squash. And normally we wouldn't get this size or this color. But this year, if there was adequate moisture, we really saw a great expression of the genetic potential of a lot of these varieties. So it was a fun year that way. Okay. We have some questions coming in. Let's get started with those. Um, Marianne in Duluth says, uh, when do I add organic material for my rhubarb and when do I transplant the rhubarb? Well, we're going to transplant in the very early spring. So you'll wait until just as the snow is beginning to melt. Pretty tough crop. You have quite a bit of leeway, but sometime in, uh, in the month of May, certainly you want to get the rhubarb transplanted. And when you're transplanting, that's when you really want to incorporate the organic in. That opens up the soil. It will serve kind of as a mulch on the, on the soil surface, and, you know, it's helpful, but you really gain the benefit by getting it down in there, and you'll do that at transplant time. Okay. We have a question from Julie in Poplar about when to harvest pumpkins, and do they need to see a frost? And a, a lot of people ask that about, about pumpkins, about apples. Yeah, harvest time is, is real interesting, uh, particularly in a year like this. We've already had uh, frosts and actually hard freezes in some of our viewing area. And you really want to evaluate them. We happen to have one right here that is nice and ripe. And as a rule of thumb, as long as the plant is still actively growing, you mm -hmm. may not want to take it off prematurely. But we have a couple of indications. You can use your thumbnail test. You want the rind to be nice and firm. Make a little mark, but you don't want to easily penetrate it. And then you really want to have a, a, a stem that is firm uh -huh. and obviously uh, begun to dry down. And then you can take them at any time. They will tolerate, of course, frost. You'll knock the vines down. But if you're going to have temperatures that are projected below 28 degrees, I always tell people, take those pumpkins, find some protection for them because you can actually damage the pumpkin or other squash when you get much below 28 degrees. All right, great. Uh, Tom, we have a question about hydrangea. Uh, this one is a two-year-old hydrangea. It's in Pengilly. It's Sharon Gr growing it there. She said it has small nubbins, I think that's a technical term, <laughs> at the root. What's going on with that? Well, those could be some nodules on the root, but more than likely not an issue and something that she really doesn't need to worry about. Uh -huh. um, and, and actually, if she can see the roots, she should add some soil. Those roots should be down an inch or two below the soil surface. So it may be an indication of it's not planted deep enough. Get some more soil in and around it, make sure it's okay. Because really most of our hydrangeas, if she's probably talking about an Annabelle, mm -hmm. it's going to die down to the ground each year. So she wants to protect those roots and make sure that they're covered. So get enough soil on Just it. a quick note, my uh, endless summer, which is supposed to have endless bloom, did not bloom again this year. <laughs> <laughs> Some, someone said to me they're calling those the endless bummer. Yeah. <laughs> it's, oh, got a great, it's got a great name, but I think it has been a little disappointing. But yeah. that's yeah. not to say the breeders are coming along. It stimulated this mm -hmm. interest in hydrangea, so it really performed its function. And there are some beautiful ones. Oh, there's there. some beautiful ones, many, yeah. many of them coming from our same wholesaler in the Twin Cities yeah. that introduced Endless yeah. Summer. And and really I, I will take a hydrangea anytime. Yeah, and really some that are doing much better than the Endless Summer now. So. Okay. All right, great. Well, um, we've, we're going to get back to those questions in, in just a bit, but we want to tell you that this spring and summer, for the very first time, Great Gardening was able to share in the glory of two seasons with our garden tourists as we headed out on bus tours in both May and July. We were greeted with the result of some exemplary horticultural skills. The early arrival of spring set the stage for a bus tour in May to the Big Lake South Shore. Along the way, an Iron River gardener welcomed us to her woodland wonderland of lush hosta beds, adorned with handcrafted giant mushroom and leaf art. Our first stop in Bayfield at the Winfield Inn found us marveling at a tiered landscape of spring blooms and mature rock garden plantings among statuary creatures with a view beyond compare. 
The rains didn't dampen our enthusiasm for some marvelously crafted residential gardens where paths wound their way through beautiful blooms both above and below. Our tour took us next on the water and aboard the Madeline Island Ferry for a look at the island gardens. There we found a colorful and vast array of springtime plantings to marvel at and admire. Our summer tour in mid-July was a hot time, visiting gardens from West Duluth to Superior and back. Abundant blooms of every shape and size welcomed us along the way. We saw one resident's Monarch Way Station, another's oasis of wonderful water features, and a gated yard that only enhances the view to the garden inside. And it was quite a contrast for us of those two tours in, in May, cold and rainy, and in July it was pretty sweltering, but uh, saw a lot of beautiful things. Yeah, the, the tour to Bayfield was really a, a spectacular one. It was and, fun. And yeah, we did battle some very rainy conditions. Uh -huh. One of them we were all, it was pouring so much we didn't even want to run to the bus, but it, uh, it really turned out great. Lots yeah, of fun. It did. It yeah. did. Certainly we get this opportunity to thank those that joined us and the people that opened their yards to us. Uh, we really have a tremendous number of great gardeners in the area. And we're planning on uh, two tours again next summer, so uh, hopefully we'll have uh, a lot of people excited about that. I already am. All right. I am too. I am too. All right. Well, the rain and flooding experienced in Duluth and the surrounding area was really unique in the Midwest. Uh, farmers in much of the country um, dealt with record heat and drought. Here's a look at uh, some of what we saw. This is in Wisconsin and uh, really devastated the corn crops. Very tough growing conditions for, for so many people. Yeah, we were fortunate here in Minnesota. We did get uh, adequate rain. We never had an overabundance after the uh, flood, of course, when we had a little more than we mm -hmm. needed. But uh, we got by. We managed to get uh, most of our crops out, and, uh, including a corn crop. So we are very fortunate. And uh, we certainly can share the pain of some of our farmers in the a uh, little bit farther we south sure in the Midwest. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, though, we were more fortunate here back in the Northland. While we did have our share of heat and dry conditions, the really good garden sweet corn was easy to find. And here's a tip from Bob to tell us more about that. Sweet corn is a classic example of where the gardener has an advantage over the dry land farmer. And sweet corn was that crop this year where if you had the moisture, because we had so much intense heat when it's setting up in July, uh, we could grow a tremendous crop. And here's an example. Uh, we didn't do anything special here. We just made sure that it had the water it needed and the nutrients it needed. And uh, it did the rest. It is a delicate crop. It's more delicate even than field corn. I think gardeners that are going to grow sweet corn, they need adequate space. It takes a fair amount of room. Uh, you've got to spread it out. You have to have a large enough stand, a population, so that it can, in fact, uh, pollinate and, and fertilize. So you need a fair amount of room. Uh, you need moisture for good control. You need the proper kind of short season varieties for us this far north. And then you're going to have to think a little bit about uh, animal protection. Deer, of course, is an issue, but raccoons have been extremely difficult. So uh, there are inexpensive electric fencing systems that are available for control there. So there are a number of components to growing it, but if it stays hot and dry and you got the water, it should be a good crop for us. Uh, these are late, later season varieties. Some of the early season varieties we were able to harvest in early August. People will often ask, how do you know when it's ripe? And, uh, you can kind of take a look at, at when, the, um, when the tassels are forming up and, uh, and when the silks are forming up, and you can say maybe 10 days to two weeks after that. But the, the real test, because things grow differently, temperatures are different, moisture is different, you want to take the actual ear itself and you want to use the thumbnail test where you actually squeeze one of the kernels and when you get a real nice milky white juice, then it's prime and ready, ready to eat. All right, thanks for that, Bob. Uh, we love that sweet corn. It's delicious and a lot of, lot of good uh, corn in these parts. 
And I really sneak down there at night after <laughs> Glen Sheen is closed and do all my shopping. You're, you're like a raccoon. <laughs> yes, I'm the it's raccoon. in there. And the fence doesn't bother me. <laughs> I know, but it did something you hear. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from the electric dresses yeah. there. Tend to just keep the raccoons out. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get back to some questions. A lot of them are coming in. Uh, we have one from Betty in Aurora who says, I have half-high blueberries that are forming witches' brooms. What should she do? And I'm not familiar with witches' brooms, but you can tell us about that. Yeah, witches', witches broom is kind of a tangled affair of, of plant material that's, that's grown uh, uh, into kind of a, a mass. It can be caused by any number of things. It can be insect-induced. It can be uh, viral-induced. Uh, she should just cut those out and not worry about them particularly. And as soon as the leaves have dropped from the, uh, the blueberries at that point, she can come in with the shear and just remove them. And it shouldn't affect the fruit next year? Hopefully not. It depends mm -hmm. on what the what the eight causative agent was that caused okay. the problem. If it's a systemic uh, fungus or systemic virus, then potentially, ultimately, she may have to remove the plant. But usually it's insects or something else that's causing it. Okay. And we should mention that Bob is thrilled that somebody has called with a question about half-high blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Love those half-highs. <laughs> um, Steve from Duluth says he's grown a winter squash successfully for over 20 years. The seed he harvests himself, but the last two years, though he's had plenty of blossoms, there hasn't been any pollination. What might be happening there? Okay. Hmm. I, I would assume it's because he's getting that blossom set at a time. He's not getting uh, fertilization. That, that could be insect activity. Uh, so we want to encourage all the pollinators. It might also be just the intense heat that we had. Uh, sometimes the pollen tube will stop growing if we have intense heat over a 48-hour period, day and night. So I think it's really a reflection of the kind of weather that we had this year. He's obviously been successful in the past and with that variety, and I think he will be in the future. And when do I harvest winter squash? Uh, quick follow-up uh, Same kind of thing on the, on the pumpkins. You want to make sure that they're good and mature. Uh, for the most part, they don't gain a lot of sugars after the plants have stopped growing. So don't take them too early. Make sure, again, that the, uh, the stem is, has dried down, there's full color, and then the skin is, and the rind is fairly firm. Okay. And before it goes below 28 degrees. Yeah, that's right. If, if you have no choice and you can't cover and you're leaving them out in the field, uh, they'll take a frost. You can knock back the vines, but you will damage the fruit if we get down to maybe about 27 or so. Okay. Uh, Walter from Esco wants to know, when do I prune my spirea and potentilla shrubs? Well, they're both summer bloomers, so he can do that now if he wants, if he's really starting to clean up his yard, <clears throat> or he can wait till spring. Either way, they're going to send new growth and bloom for him next year, so either time is good. Okay. All right. We're going to have to hold off on questions for a bit more. Um, and for many people, a good mix of things to eat along with abundant flowers to feed our psyche is the perfect combination in a garden. Here's our tour in Carleton County that fits the bill. Hi, my name is Roberta Liu and this is our garden. We live out in um, Riverton Township outside of Cloquet. Well, I like flowers a little bit better than vegetables, but they're nice too to have. I think if you have just all of one thing, then it gets a little boring. Once it's planted, if you kind of start out with the right kind of, of good dirt, uh, the ground or from the ground up, don't just throw it in. Like a lot of people will just try to take the sod away and then it doesn't always work. That's why I've got a lot of raised beds. Over there is the, the bottom of the coal burning stove from my mom, where I grew up on my farm in Noka County. And, uh, some of that stuff has sentimental value, it's kind of fun. It doesn't look like a lot, but most of these are perennials. And so almost all the plants I've gotten either from friends or family or people that we know. And I just like the mix of flowers with the vegetables. And I get tired of square rows, so that's why I put down, I find those metal rings from, I think they're old wheel spokes and stuff, or wheel from wagons. And so I put those down, but then it kind of keeps, you can keep track of where the things are planted. But this is a forget-me-not that was from my mom's place. And this was a yellow Swedish pea from my sister Ruth. And my son Joe gave me that little pink rose bush. This heat, some certain plants, of course, the squash, the cucumbers, love it, and tomatoes, and the gourds. They're, they just start going crazy with the heat. But the lettuce is a little bit wilty. We didn't have a tree to put the hammock up on, so Walt built the structure in order to put the hammock in there. And then the robins always build nests up above. These were decorative and they grew so good and that my son John and Walt put up the hops frame out there. And they've made, they have friends that have made beer 
They're usually beautiful and they'll be all the way up the top. I think it was that early, early spring that messed them up. Anything that you pull up, the weeds, the carrot tops, tomatoes, the goats will, the people think they'll eat anything. They're picky eaters actually, but they love anything organic. I don't know what I'd do if I lived in town and had to try to compost. Work with what you've got instead of struggling to try to make it work some other way. Otherwise, you're gonna, if you start too big too, it's gonna, you're gonna be disappointed. I don't like to follow a lot of the rules um, with gardening. I, I think then it gets a little bit kind of too much like school. All right, thanks to Roberta for that tour. That was a, a really nice garden, very, beautiful. Very nice. Well, you can't talk about the fall harvest without a review of our most versatile fruit and uh, apples and apple trees. They're abundant around the Northland. We have a look at some beautiful ones that happen to have come from... <laughs> from my yard. Tom Casper's yard. <laughs> yeah, that's the one with the strap on it. Uh, it has so many apples on it. That's a Harrelson, as you can see, the red apples forming on it. Um, really got so many apples it started to tip over um, and I had to strap it to another tree and then pull it up with a come along and uh, and there of course is the apple up close so mm -hmm. really a spectacular year again with all that heat we've had uh, if you we were able to get water to those trees or if they were well established and could draw from the moisture in the soil. Many had beautiful out. apples some others namely myself <laughs> and some <laughs> others <laughs> um, had apple scab and talk to us a little bit about what causes that. Yeah, there's a classic example of severe uh, apple scab, and that's a fungal disease, and a little bit of it's with us every year. I don't know that this was uh, particularly worse than any other given year, but in this case, it was pretty severe. Uh, first thing you want to do is, uh, coming into the fall here, let's make sure all that fruit and all the leaf tissue is cleaned up and either uh, properly composted or hauled off site or buried. We want to get it uh, away so we don't have any of the inoculum for next year. And then there are a few uh, fungicides. Uh, if you get two years in a row, you can do some damage to young trees. So you might consider a fungicide has to go on early. And uh, you want to be very careful reading the label. Mm -hmm. uh, our, many of our common fungicides are labeled for ornamental crabs and not for edibles. So captan would be a material that is labeled for your edible. And that answers <coughs> our question, hopefully, from Dave and Duluth, who want to know about a apple scab and how to treat it. We have a lot of questions here coming in. Claudia from Superior wants to know about horseradish plants when to harvest them and how to harvest them. Mm. Well, they get sweeter as you go, so the big thing with horseradish is you definitely can leave them in the ground. You may want to mulch them in. Um, the thing you have to be aware of is that they tend to be quite invasive. So if you're going to start horseradish, beware. I hope you really enjoy horseradish <laughs> or keep it contained in and an area of the garden. And it's Good ornamental time. nature. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and like Bob said, you could, if you are going to do horseradish, plant it right in a container where okay. the roots can't spread out. So. All right. Dan from Renshaw wants to know if you can use hay or straw around roses for mulch instead of burying them. Does that work? Um, for shrub roses, it's okay. For hybrid teas, you really do need to use the Minnesota tip method, which is what is incorporated at the Rose Garden here in Duluth, okay. um, which is you, you turn those roses completely on their side, covering them up with soil, and then you can use straw or hay, excuse me, hay, uh, preferably bag leaves works better, but if he's talking about shrub roses, straw is probably fine for that. All right, Donna in Three Lakes said she turned the soil in early spring. It appeared to have white frost in it or beans and carrots grew fine but the white is still in the soil as she pulls the plants up. Mm. Any idea what that might be or a it's concern? It's really cold there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who says that it's getting warmer? No, she probably is dealing with uh, one of two things. If it's real white, it's probably a mycelia from some soil-borne fungi or it may be actually uh, root tissue. We get these root masses if she has uh, uh, aspen or uh, quaking uh, poplar in the area, they can give you these white uh, root masses as well. So one okay. or the other, we'd have to take a closer look. Marion Brule wants to know the west, best way to keep geraniums over for over winter for next year. And then uh, also where we have a question from Sharon in Two Harbors about gabura daisies and bringing them inside. Both are, are handled a little differently. Okay. Geraniums you can bring inside and, and, well, the Gerber daisies you can as well. If you have a nice, bright, sunny window, you can continue to grow those right in your home if you have enough sun, making sure you cut back on the water a little bit and watch for, uh, for insect problems. Um, so you want to watch that. In the case of geraniums, you can actually remove those completely from the pot and store in a cool area if you have a basement that isn't heated. 
that gets no, not above about 40 degrees. So if you have a root cellar or something like that, they'll do very well. And, or you can cut them down in the pot and also store them as long as that soil doesn't freeze. So. Okay. Um, Bob, we have a couple of tomato questions. Yvonne in Ashland says, what prevents or cures end blossom rot? And then somebody has a container, Sue has a container grown tomato named Sweet Cluster that had green collar around the stem, which mm. turned to rot. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Are those similar or separate? They're separate, okay. uh, separate problems. And the, um, the blossom end rot is out of the far, the, the far end of the plant. And that basically, particularly if it's in containers, it's a calcium deficiency. So uh, she will want to incorporate calcium. If you have an acidic soil, you can use a, a little bit of limestone with your mix. Uh, there also are some calcium supplements that can be used. We saw in regard to the other question where we had what we called green shoulders. And that again is a function of the, the type of rapid growth that we had early. and. Uh, the green shoulder became, uh, really didn't properly ripen, so it turned mm -hmm. to a rot, and it's totally a function, it's what we call a physiological disorder, totally a function of the manner in which the plant grew and the kinds of temperatures we had when it was growing. Some varieties are more <coughs> susceptible than the others, but I would say that we saw a lot of that this year, and people that, if you had these unusual tomatoes where they right. were orange or red and yellow on the shoulders, that's not true to type, that's not common to those varieties. Mm -hmm. Don't plant them again with that expectation. That was a function of the growing season we had. Okay. And, and really, even in the blossom end rot can be a function of the growing season we've had too. If, if people are struggling in the container situation with getting enough water to those plants to make sure that they're routinely watered, and also if they're growing so rapidly that they're depleting any of the nutrients in the soil. So, so take heart. It wasn't necessarily the gardener's <laughs> fault. It was, right. it was the weather. It was the weather. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we have time for one more this round. Jean from Duluth says her flame maple tree is 10 feet tall. It's supposed to turn bright red in the fall, but only the tips are red. Well, <clears throat> it's not quite fall yet, Jean. Um, <laughs> Give it some time, okay. more than likely it will still develop that. And really a lot of them sometimes will take a few years before they start to develop that fall color and is really a product of the type of fall that we have. Some of them are gonna go in faster. Sure. Some of them are delayed depending on how much sunlight it's growing in. So there's really a lot of factors that will dictate the color that you'll get on that tree. You know, we've had an early season, but sometimes we, now we're getting a little bit of moisture, we revert back to the norm and really mm -hmm. the, the peak color isn't until the end of the month. So it's a little ways away yet. Yep. Okay, great. Well, we'll have more questions uh, coming up, but harvest time is demanding and it tests us to make good use of what we gather. And right now we want to take you to a place where we'll show you a timeless method of food preservation. Well, I'm going to take you through the steps of water bath canning. So the first thing you do is you get your jars in nice hot soapy water. Um, or if you have um, a dishwasher that has a really um, hot sanitizing rinse, you can use that um, to sanitize your jars. I have this roaster that is a really nice asset in the canning kitchen. If there's about an inch of water in there, and I'm just putting them in, and this is just to keep them hot. So everything when you're canning, you wanna keep hot and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is to prevent any uh, microorganisms or pathogen, pathogens from uh, growing in your product and also to um, keep any heat differentiation down so that there's, if there's a real, just if you imagine if there's a real cold substance in a real hot jar, the jar could shatter. It's important to use a tested recipe so um, if you're getting recipes handed down through the generations in your family, um, make sure that you, um, you can use them as long as you cross-reference them with a tested recipe. You'll want to use a publication that's um, either from Ball, Kerr, or um, the extension services in your state. A sauce, small saucepan, just put a couple of inches of water in it. It'll be enough to cover your lids. Notice I'm taking new lids out of a box because you always use new lids and that's so that you have a good seal. And they're hot, so I have this really great tool. It's called a jar grabber. Very carefully ladle in my hot salsa. Head space is the space between the bottom of the, li the lid and the top of your 
uh, product. More than half an inch is okay, less than half an inch is not okay. Um, the, the problem with it being more than half an inch is that it could cause siphoning. Um, siphoning is when the liquid is sucked up by the process of the vacuum seal, which is what's going on in the canner, and then the product spills over and it compromises the seal. You have your clean rag and you're going to go around the top where the seal and then just, you know, I kind of get the, just inside the jar too. Um, just so that it's nice and clean and it can make a nice tight seal. Um, this is an awesome tool. This is a magnetic lid lifter. Um, so I'm just going to put the hot lid on top of all my jars and then I'm going to grab my um, screw bands and this is the tricky or this is an important part is when you tighten it people want to crank it down because you think it should you know be tight but you want to just do it fingertip tight that's what they say fingertip tight so that air can escape to get that vacuum seal I'm going to take my um, jar grabber and I'm going to fill the rack I always load opposite of each other so that it um, balances the rack and everything doesn't flip over. You want to try to keep things upright there again to keep the seal clean. So then I'm going to very carefully drop the rack with the jars down into the boiling hot water bath. I'm going to check to make sure the level of the water above the jars is at least one inch, but between one and two inches. Okay, so it's a rolling boil. I'm just going to cover it up and I'm going to start my clock for 20 minutes. Each recipe is different, so you'll want to just check the recipe. It'll explain. So I'm going to lift the lid away from me. And now this is the part that requires a little finesse and I think everybody does it a little differently. So I'm just going to grab on. And I'm going to set that on the edges like that. And hopefully what you want to listen for is all those seals going pop, 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 pop. And what that is, is the seal happening. Um, if it fails to seal, you're going to want to, you're going to want to um, reprocess it for the same amount of time. I'm going to take the jars out and I'm going to space them out so there's plenty of airflow around them so that they cool off. Um, the canning process from start to finish, you know, including all the preparation of the uh, fruits or vegetables that you're using uh, takes between four and six hours usually for a recipe. My jars are cool and I'm just gonna take the bands off so that's something that you can do that you should do so that you can monitor um, you know what's going on inside your jar make sure the seal still good make sure there's no mold growth or anything like that in there. It's nice and sealed nice and tight. And then you're also going to want to label it so a sharpie marker works really nice um, you know make sure you have the date and then what it is on there and then it can go right into your pantry. I like to can because I'm a gardener and um, it's really rewarding to take something that you've grown and then preserve it. It's fresher, um, the quality's better, you can control ingredients, it's, it's just good, good and it's just great to have a stock pantry. And of course there's a big difference between water bath canning and pressure canning and uh, you have to really know what you're doing but um, you know Jamie very enthusiastic uh, did, a, did a great job and there's a lot of help out there in education if you want to do your own canning at the Duluth Community Garden Program. They even have supplies that you can borrow and so much more so you can go to their website or call them for more information and there's, there's the number up on your screen. Okay, we have time for more questions, so let's get right Great. to them. Harvey in Grand Marais has uh, 1,000 feet from the lake, an apple tree, and wonders when he should pick the apples. Uh, it hasn't frozen up there yet, but the trees are loaded, and he wants to pick them at just the right time. <laughs> right. Well, that's perfect. Yeah, and really, he could go out and check one. Take that's a couple sweet. of bites, sure. you know, if it's the sweetness that he likes, he can start picking them or hold off, you know, and it, same thing, you don't want to get too cold. But some of these cooler nights that we've had now really are beneficial to those sugars. Yeah. Tom, you had Harold Red, which is a late maturing apple, to get the sugars up. And as a rule of thumb, people used to say you cut them and look at the uh, seeds when they're dark. That isn't always necessarily reliable. But if they separate easily from the tree, and if there's color on the outside, and then ultimately you got to try them. And if the sugars are there, uh, you're ready to go. Yeah. 
And aren't there some apples, too, that you, uh, you pick and you can store for a while before they're really ready to eat? But would people know that they have that type? Much. It's usually the late maturing apples that are the best storage apples. So those apples like State Fair and others that came in early uh, typically don't store very well. So the Harrelsons, the Harrell Reds, uh, the Sweet Sixteens, these are worth waiting for because sure. they store much better. Okay, great. Uh, Betty from Hermantown has strawberries in a clay pot. How should she winter that? She really can't. She's going to have to take it out of the pot and plant it in the garden. It won't, more than likely won't survive in that container. Okay. You're definitely right there, Tom. You Thank know. you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> she might sink. If she doesn't want to do that, she could sink the entire pot right, into yeah. the ground. But uh, cold penetration, they're, they're probably not going to make it unless she really protects them. Okay. Jerry in Two Harbors wants to know if there's any fall preparation I can do that will help with next summer's cutworms. And a, a lot of people struggled mm. with them this year. What do you think, Tom? Cold. Yeah, that's right. Pray for cold winter and cold spring. I, I think they weren't uh, indigenous to the area, weren't native, and they blew in in March. We never had that cold weather in March to freeze them down. So there really isn't much we can do. Hopefully we'll return to more normal conditions. They won't be a problem next so year. So next spring when we're all shivering and shaking in April, <laughs> think of it as this is good for no cutworms. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, get rid of those worms. Okay. Well, uh, Marsha in Two Harbors wants to know how to plant tulips in a pot so they'll bloom in spring. And uh, we have covered this before. In right. fact, Tom, you showed us how and with, with great success. So let's yeah, go over that. Really quickly, the, the, what she's talking about is forcing them. And what she wants to do is take a container or a pot, plant them just below the soil surface. So actually you can see the tips of the tulip bulbs or any kind of bulb that she wants to force. Put those in the refrigerator or somewhere that stays between 32 and 38 degrees uh, and they'll need to be in there about 12 weeks um, of cool, consistently cool temperature. After that period or that cooling period, she can take them out March uh, whenever she happens to, from the 12 weeks from when she does it, put them in a uh, cool area away from the sun for a few days and then slowly move them into a sunny location and she'll have a beautiful container of tulip bulbs. So. Okay. It's great. great. You know, while we're, uh, while we're on the topic of planting fall bulbs, it's been so warm and soil temperatures are so warm right now, don't start that process too early. You right. don't want them to jump out of the ground. So we're probably looking at October for planting a lot of the tulip bulbs rather than late September. That's right. Good point. Okay. Well, Chuck from the city of Duluth says he has an elderberry about three years old. He's wondering if it is recommended to prune that back every year. You know, I, I don't think it's necessary. You know, if he wants to prune it to, to keep its size, I think that would be fine. But otherwise, they can just uh, continue to grow. Okay. Dennis from Eveleth has a crabapple tree that uh, is harvested. It had 10 to 12 inches of branches die back last year. The leaves dry and curl up, and this year uh, some branches died. Ooh. <laughs> dry and, dry and uh oh, <laughs> yeah. doesn't sound good, Dennis. No, it doesn't sound very good oh, for Dennis. You, you, think, you think it's it's uh, not going to survive? Sounds maybe like fire blight could be. Yeah, there are some confirming symptoms, but fire blight is what we really get concerned about, rather than the apple scab and other fungal diseases, mm -hmm. because that's bacterial. And uh, my experience with some of the antibiotics out there is they're not particularly effective. Uh, he can prune out some of those areas if he's seen darkened areas, but he definitely wants to wait until. Uh, winter. This is the main reason and the main disease why we were always pruning apples or recommending them to be pruned during the winter or dormant season. Yep. And really wherever he sees that damage prune at least a foot beyond where the last part of that damage is to ensure that he gets all that bacteria out of the, the plant. Okay. So, all but right. probably not good. Okay, darn. All right, um, here's one about grapes. Um, let's see, this is from Joy. And uh, she had uh, grape vines for over 10 years had problems with them the past four years. The leaves unfurl in the spring, lovely green and shiny, but then they develop spots. Then the fruit sets and begins to form spots on it as well. Do we know what's going on there? More than likely it's fungal disease, which is okay. a, the downfall of grapes in a, in a humid environment. So uh, there are some fungicides if she's looking for organic controls. Uh, the original copper mixes and uh, some of the Bordeaux mixes probably are, are options for her. Okay. Okay, well, I, we don't have time for a lot more questions. I know you guys have your thoughts on this one. How do I keep deer out of my garden? That's from, uh, from Jack in Cloquet. I'll go first. All right. Uh, the deer sprinklers that I use at home that I incorporate uh, hook up to your sprinkler or your, your water source. 
a motion sensor on them with a, uh, a directional sprinkler works very well. That's all I use at home and have great success, and it's chased Bob out of the yard <laughs> a couple yes, of times, too. My question, of course, is uh, it sounds great, and the weather's warming, but how do they work in January? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, they, they are effective uh, at intruders of all types. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think really, uh, you know, a fence, fencing areas, particularly if you've got woody, uh, perennial material and, and they're very vulnerable right now there's a tremendous deer herd out there and it they sure will be is. starting to feed mm -hmm. uh, pretty voraciously soon uh, make sure that fence is at least above their sight line uh, you know they'll come up and they'll investigate and make sure you got a firm fence that's at least that high the smaller the area the shorter the fence but uh, that's the only real reliable way through the winter months to keep them out that I'm aware of okay all right. Well, that's all the time for, for questions, but uh, we have more to talk about. We want to show you a look at some of the successes that have been shared with us by some Northland great gardeners. Who knew they could grow them this big on the notoriously cool hillside in Duluth? Natalie Crowley had tried for years, and the heat of this summer finally brought an award-winning zucchini that took top honors at the Minnesota State Fair for largest zucchini, measuring 29 and a half inches. Another award-winning squash grown by Susan Kochi in Floodwood, the trombone squash was dubbed champion at the Southwest St. Louis County Fair, measuring 48 inches long. Brenda from Solon Springs wanted to share the beauty of her clematis, which saw its fullest and best season this year. In Washburn, Wisconsin, Martha's White Cosmos kept their beauty as they bowed to the ground. Martha says they remain her favorite and most reliable annuals. And this bright pink hibiscus comes from Celia in South Range, where it grows near vibrant lilies watched over by the cat and a tree climbing morning glory. Please continue to share your flowers and plants with Great Gardening by sending them to greatgardening at wdse.org. All right, we love to see the success stories of our viewers, and please keep sending those pictures in. But um, if you want to keep having success, the work isn't over. We have chores that need to be done this fall to ensure a successful, uh, successful garden for next year. And let's take a, a quick look at some of those. Um, Tom, we start with uh, actually just clearing out the beds and cleaning things out. Right. I'm really a firm believer in getting all that old material cleaned out of your bed. Some folks like to let it die down, and it does help sometimes with insulating the garden, but I really like to clean that up in the fall, especially if we're dealing with lots of disease problems and insect problems. Get it all cleaned up, get it out, get it into your compost pile, or if it is heavily diseased kinds of things, get it out of, uh, out of the area, either into your garbage or, or other ways to dispose of it that uh, will, will really reduce that fungus problem into the future. So. Okay, and we want to cover our tender perennials, but uh, different ways to do that, especially when you're considering things like roses as opposed to strawberries. Right. Um, I'll do the roses. Okay. <clears throat> we did talk about that briefly using the Minnesota tip, tip method if they are uh, tender roses and then if they're the shrub roses. Really more than after the first or second year, you shouldn't have to do anything with them, but if you want, you can do some straw. Bob, strawberries? Strawberries, yeah. In this case, we want to protect the flower buds that were set up in the fall of the year. So again, you don't want to go too early. You want to make sure that they've been tempered by cooler temperatures. So you wait until uh, the temperatures have been holding between 20 and 25, and then on that night when they're forecasting 17 degrees, you make sure you get them well <laughs> okay. covered with straw. All right. And uh, get a soil test. Fall is a good time to do that. Absolutely. Great time. As a matter of fact, in October, we are going to have a couple sessions in the area on that very topic of taking soil tests and soil test interpretation. Ideal time to do it because uh, the labs aren't quite as busy. You get the results back faster. And if you need to amend the soil, some amendments should be done in the fall. Okay, and we want to clean up those tools that right. we use in the garden all summer long. Yeah, get those shovels and everything cleaned up. If you get a chance, inspect them if you need to replace them so you're ready to go in the spring. Also, disinfecting your, your shovels and your pruners and stuff like that for any of those diseases that you might have been carrying around on your tools. So. All right, we have our work cut out for us. Uh, yes. Inspiration, though, is uh, it's going to be that much easier in the spring. That's right. And you know all it right. really isn't work. No, now it we have to say work, this, this is okay. necessary physical activity that all of us that sit at a desk during the day uh, need to have. So That's we'll look so at true. it that way. Very true. Okay. Well, 
Now uh, we want to take a look at some of what we'll be sharing with you coming up next season on Great Gardening. In our 11th season of Great Gardening, we'll take a look at how to plan and plot a kitchen garden. The idea was that we would have all sorts of different greens, partly because they're so easy to prepare and partly because they're so healthy and partly because you can just pick them and eat them. When we just want to make some dinner quick, we just come out here and get what we need and all set. And for us, I mean, there's just the two of us now, it's just a really nice size. We tour a garden in East Superior with an astonishing number of hostas. Last count was several years ago, it's around 100, 350, I'm guessing probably maybe 400 now. They're all over the whole yard in different places. And we take you on a magical tour where a yard has been transformed with several small garden houses. There's a high bush cranberry in the back of our yard here that I think is kind of pretty. So I put a little sitting area there so we could have a little tea. Tom, you've been to that garden that yeah. we're going to show next year. Mike and Mary Mary's Jane. garden, really spectacular. It was on our secret garden tour this year, and people just raved about it. Yeah, we can't wait to show you the rest of that next season, and we begin again in March to get growing for 2013. Well, there is still time to get out and have fun this fall. How about a visit to a corn maze? Here's a look at how to enjoy and how to grow one. Welcome to the corn maze. Um, you're in Hermantown, Minnesota, uh, so we're uh, 10 minutes from downtown Duluth, we're five minutes from the Miller Mall, uh, but we're out in the middle of the country. Things were a little wet uh, prior to that, and I would have wanted to have planted the end of May, but, uh, uh, but June 5th was the plant date this year. Um, we plant thicker than corn is recommended. There are, there are farms uh, around that, that grow sweet corn and grow field corn. This is field corn. This is not sweet corn. This is not edible corn for us. You could certainly eat it, but it doesn't taste very good. Generally, we'll cut anywhere from uh, probably eight inches to 15 inches height of the corn. We can see the whole field. You can see the paths as we're cutting them. Uh, but this is about a month after planting is, uh, is, is the time to do it. We're about five weeks this year. It's pretty basic. I've got some markers that you'll see that are out in the field that give me points of reference as I'm looking at the map and cutting so that I know where I am in relation to other paths that have been cut. Acreage-wise, there's a little bit more than 100,000 square feet, which is a small corn maze uh, by corn maze standards. We've got just a great, neat program where we have an educator that comes in uh, and uh, uh, we invite uh, elementary school kids from around the area. So kids get a chance, obviously, to have fun in the corn maze. But uh, prior to doing that, uh, we get the kids together in our education room and talk about uh, taking care of the earth, uh, talk about sustainability, talking about enjoying the earth. Uh, so it's just, it's a pretty neat, uh, neat deal. The kids enjoy it. Uh, teachers uh, uh, enjoy it from an educational uh, perspective. Uh, uh, and so we're, we're, we're excited that we've, uh, that we can do that and incorporate that into what happens with the corn maze. So something fun to do and just interesting, sting, interesting excuse me, to see how, how that corn grows uh, a little bit differently than what uh, you were growing with the sweet mm. corn. Field corn is a little tougher than sweet corn. It yeah. takes a little less water, and, and, and this year that was real desirable. Right, right. Okay, a couple of events coming up this fall that we want to tell you about, and one is uh, with regard to the year of the beet. Uh, beets are going to take on potatoes, Bob. Yeah, we decided we'd have a little contest, and this is our fall activity where uh, folks are going to learn how to grow both potatoes and beets, and then they're going to fight it off with uh, recipes prepared by the St. Louis County Master Gardeners, you're going to taste test the more than 30 dishes, and you get to vote for your favorites. So that's next Thursday night, September 22nd. Uh, call the St. Louis County Extension at 733-2870 to register. Okay, and then coming up in October, uh, we're going to take a look ahead to the to the coming season. Another couple of uh, workshops and events you have there. Yeah, they'll be similar. One program down in Lincoln Park and the other in Mount Iron, so the range and down in Duluth. And soils are very important, still an opportunity to get that soil test in and done. We're going to take a look at uh, what went well this year and what we can expect in 2013 in, in terms of some of the newer varieties that are out there. It's going to be a nice activity. All right. Well, it's been great. We've got a lot of good information in on the show. Uh, wonderful harvest, wonderful time of year. 
We do want to ask you before we go about your predictions for the growing season well, for 2013. Well, let me look into my crystal cantaloupe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll go first. Okay. okay. I see a great season with, with great friends growing great things in our garden. How about you, Bob? That's great. I can't compete with that. I, you know, I am going to prepare again for hot and dry, and then I'll know it'll be cold and wet. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll thank you. All right, we'll, get you, we'll let you get away with that since you provided so much expert advice tonight. And again, thank you for that. We also want to thank our phone volunteers, the St. Louis County Master Gardeners, all of you who watched and called in. Our next season, as we mentioned, begins in March. Uh, but until then, please keep an eye on our website at greatgardening at wdse.org. For Bob and Tom and all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden. Mm -hmm.